Welcome everyone. We are really excited to have this session today with Parent to Parent USA. I'm Natasha Bonham, the program director for the Family Center, and I will speak a bit to that in a moment. Just to let you all know, we are recording. So if you have to step out or want to share this with someone, uh, the recording will be available uh, shortly after our session. We have a great lineup today of people who will be speaking to the support and the different offerings from Parent to Parent USA. And so with that, we can jump right in. Just a few housekeeping items. Uh, this webinar is scheduled to last about an hour, and that includes the answer and question portion. Um, all dial-in participants should be muted. Um, I think some people, as they've joined in, they've been unmuted. So please uh, just double check that you are muted and that um, this will allow us to have our presenters speak without uh, any interruptions. Um, as I said, this will be recorded and then we will send it out via email, including the slides and other resources that we will discuss during our session today. Questions can be submitted through the chat feature and we will spend some dedicated time uh, going through those questions and, 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 and answering them. Just letting a few more people in and great so we can go and dive right in our agenda there'll be a short introduction to the family center and then we will spend the bulk of the time speaking with our presenters so the national genetics education and family support center which i will refer to as the family center is a program that's funded by uh, the health resources and services administration the purpose of this program is really to help families develop skills so that they can partner with professionals and improve different healthcare systems. I will say a lot of our work is also to work with professionals so they understand how to partner with parents and families and have um, more opportunities so that their perspectives and um, knowledge can really be shared with within the healthcare systems that those health professionals are working in. We assist the regional genetics networks in partnering with families and family-led organizations. We also assist with outreach to diverse and medically underserved families and also provide education and support as it relates to genetics education and what is available around genetic services. The Family Center is made up of the Expecting Health team at Genetic Alliance, as well as our partners from Family Voices and Parent to Parent USA. One item I wanted to share with you all is a project that has had many different iterations over the years, uh, but really is meant to be a tool to help people who work in, a, in the different regions connect and partner with family-led organizations. Here you see an excerpt from the reference guide, which is focused on the Mountain States regions, where we list very clearly the parent-to-parent -parent, as well as other um, organizations, family focused organizations within a region so that whoever may be looking for those connections can find it very easily. This is something that we can send the link out to later in this session so that you can easily find it and we update it quite frequently. So if you have any suggestions or additions We'll, we always want to hear about that. Great. So with that, I will pass this along to our presenters and I will allow them to introduce themselves and uh, get going on this part of the session. Great. Thank you, Natasha. Um, thank you, everybody, for this opportunity. Thank you, Joel and Natasha at Genetic Alliance and members of the Family Center, um, the RGNs and partners for this uh, awesome opportunity to share more about Parents Parent USA. We're gonna be giving you an overview of our peer support and family engagement. 
So next, I'll go ahead and introduce our team who will be presenting today. Um, with us is our co-executive director for Parent to Parent USA, Ms. Lily Brown, who's in Austin, Texas. Myself, Marcia Quinn, co-executive director with Lily, and I am based out of Seattle. And we have Carmina Serioli, the co-executive director for PATH in Connecticut, and she is also a, uh, our Parent to Parent USA board president. So we'll be co-presenting today's um, program. Thanks. So next slide, Natasha. Okay, without further ado, um, obviously we're a family-led organization. We focus on our parents and our personal stories, which are near and dear to our hearts. So this is Lily, our co-executive director, and her story of um, with her daughter, Susie. Hi, my name is Lily Brown and I'm co-executive director for Parent to Parent USA. Today I would like to share my story as Susie's mother. Most people would say that I'm a planner. Uh, for example, before I even considered having a child, I signed up for genetic testing. It was an off-the-shelf test, very easy, but I was relieved to know that I didn't carry any of the variants that could be detected and that neither did my husband. When it came time to planning for birth, we had an entire folder of shared documents on our phones, contact information, checklists, all the way down to a uh, hospital map, just in case. I also knew that I wanted our child to learn French since it's my first language. So the year Susie was born, I met with the director of the perfect bilingual school and we moved within the attendance zone, you know, so we could be there on the list by the time she turned five. On paper, it seemed like a great plan. However, what I didn't plan for was starting off with a stay in the NICU for reasons that were never entirely clear. A few months later, I heard the dreaded words from the pediatrician. I don't want to worry you, but as she was referring us to a neurologist, that's around the time where the delays started to become more obvious. So the play dates were slowly replaced by therapy sessions physical, speech, occupational, you name it. And after more referrals to more specialists, we had a list of symptoms, microcephaly, low muscle tone, high myopia, but still no cause. By the time we were ready for whole exam sequencing, Susie was three years old, and it had taken so long to get an appointment with the geneticist that I had a suspicion of a syndrome that I had found online. Of course, I didn't tell the geneticist. Um, part of me was hoping that it was so rare that Susie didn't have it. I will never forget getting that phone call from the doctor's office and finding out that Susie has Cohen syndrome. It's a very rare syndrome with about a thousand people diagnosed worldwide. Not all the symptoms expressed themselves, um, although we did notice the cheerful disposition. But after three years of uncertainty, instead of feeling relief, we felt more worries about the future. We had to grieve the loss of hopes and dreams while learning what felt to me like a third language. Uh, to navigate the medical and education systems. It's very hard. It's exhausting. It's stressful. It's lonely when your own family and friends don't understand what you're going through. And it's not a linear progression either. So with every transition, we know that there's a risk of being thrown right back into survival mode. So how do you go from surviving to thriving? Well, the key to getting to a better place is to find a guide, someone who can 
help you understand your feelings and commiserate, but also reflect on your strengths and celebrate. Someone who can help you see that it's going to be okay and you can start planning again. And this is Lisa. She's been there and she's one of my guides. Some of those details are unique to my family, but this is an all too common story for parents of children with genetic conditions and with special health care needs in general. Yes, it's hard, but it doesn't have to be this hard. In helping parents find that guide, that connection through shared experience is at the heart of parent-to-parent -parent programs. So please let parents know that peer support is available because the sooner they can get to parent-to-parent, -to -parent, the sooner they can get some relief. Thank you. Thanks, Lily. I think um, all the parents in the room can relate to Lily and her story. Um, our stories are all different, but all have some common thread. She talked about the four stages, or she related to the different stages of adaptation. And I just asked if you could go to the next slide, Natasha. I just asked, you know, how do parents progress from the shock, denial, fear, and anxiety that follows a diagnosis? What is the sense of the future, like Lily had talked about, and how to make the positive or lemonade out of lemons? The emotional adaptation to a child having a disability varies from parent to parent, even day to day. Regardless how we all deal with our situations, we want to go to four, you know, the four stages of adaptation, adaptation being surviving, searching, settling in, and separating. I think uh, what, how I like to describe it is being a coach of a team or a sport that you've never played before. And you don't know what the rules are. You don't know uh, how much budget you have. You don't know what the ingredients to the recipe to help your child with are, but you have to create it on your own. And um, I hope by parents finding other parents in a similar situation that they won't have to feel like I did, isolated as a, of a coach of a team that I had no idea how to coach. Next slide. So this is Carmina's turn. <laughs> so you might be wondering how and where did parent to parent start? So let me take you back to the 1960s. Um, it really started in the 60s with the parent that it took two years for her to get a diagnosis for her child. And then on top of that, another two years to speak to another parent that has literally, that understands what you're going through and what she was going through. Um, so as the years went on, she was continuing to provide the support, um, and this was through the arc of Omaha, Nebraska. And fast forward to 1971, they established a pilot program in Nebraska to help families with kids with special needs navigate and be able to support each other. The heart of the parent-to-parent -parent support grew out of the need for parents who have a child with special needs and to connect with a parent whose child is facing the same situation that they are. In 1974, they received a federal grant, the um, Ark of Omaha, and to provide training to four other states on the pilot, the parent pilot program. So Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, and Missouri were trained next. Studies have been conducted through the years in the 1980s and the 1990s to show how important parent-to-parent -parent, parent -parent is, truly is. In 2003, uh, Parent to Parent USA received federal funding uh, or funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to ensure that parents of children and youth with special health care needs receive that crucial one-to-one -one connection. And at times, this connection is a lifeline for families while they wait for a doctor's appointment or even a diagnosis. The next slide, please. <laughs> Here, 
Arts Parent Movement. We've been around for 40 years. Um, and we're providing the support to families nationwide. Um, I also want to mention that not only do we provide support here in the United States, but we've also helped organize parent to parent internationally. So we have partners in New Zealand, um, Netherlands, Sicily, Ukraine, and there's a few other states there. And you can go to our website, P2P USA, if you'd like to take a look at this map. Um, a little bit more, but you can see there's been a lot of history uh, throughout the years. Next slide, please. So our mission is to support a national network of parent-to-parent -parent programs and to ensure access to quality emotional support for families and individuals with disabilities or special health care needs. We are not disability specific. We provide support to all families that have children with special needs. And the vision is that P2P USA will support a network of parent-to-parent -parent programs in all 50 states, and at the moment we're at 38 Alliance members, through support, training, technical assistance, and resources. Next slide. Each family's journey is unique and can offer hope and inspiration to others who feel alone and isolated. Um, who better than someone that has pretty much walked the walk um, to be able to talk to. The peer support fosters mutual growth and resilience and speaking with a parent um, of peer support, it builds knowledge and strength and moves forward to a, a great life for the family. We are evidence-based, and I'm sure Marshall will talk about this a little a bit later, but it's nice to know that if I, in here in Connecticut, if there's a family with a very unique um, condition and they wanna speak to another family, we have the ability to connect with our other partners throughout the country. So we can call and reach upon somebody in California and be able to connect the two families together, knowing that this match will be just as good as if it was in Connecticut because we we followed all the evidence-based practices, each state. Um, and then the leadership. Um, it's the peer-to-peer -peer support, which is unlike any other intervention for families. And it is a grassroots form of social emotional support that only a parent with similar situations can provide. Next slide. It's you, Marcia. So when we talk about peer-to-peer -peer support, we, uh, a lot of different people call it different names, but we like to refer to it as a support parent. So we train volunteers in the community to be support parents so that they could be matched with a person in a similar situation and mentor that person. And typically what those trainings look like, I'm gonna do a little overview. Um, there's typically five modules. The first being um, the basics about P2P. Obviously, they need to know our mission and vision um, and our values, our history and best practices. And then we all also want to teach them what parent support is and what it looks like. Our second module is dealing with your own emotions while trying to help others through their crisis or their, their journey. Um, the third is, um, or excuse me, and understanding and coping with emotions. The fourth is active listening skills. We want to know that the family can trust this person to be pri private with their information um, and to not always inflect their, their own situation upon that person, but to be a good listener and know that they will trust what, what you say you will do um, and follow through with it. And then part five, which is always um, my go-to, is caring. <clears throat> and mostly, in order for them to care for somebody else, they have to be able to care for themselves. So self-care techniques, what they can do to cope, um, walking them through those very fragile early steps of diagnosis or whatever challenge they're in at the time. So those are the, the basics of our training modules across the country. Next slide, Natasha. And then a little bit about what, what it looks like. So um, in our different member organizations, they each do trainings um, with some standard operating guidelines, but we, we pulled our, our 
members and um, asked, what does it look like in your state? Um, obviously, they're formally trained volunteers who are offered some sort of a certificate or acknowledgement of their training once they're done. Um, those trainings can look very different across the country. Um, what mostly um, these days, obviously, with COVID and everything that's going on, um, everything's online. So everybody's switching to different um, forms of doing it. Um, a combination of YouTube with modules and a quiz or a, uh, like um, Carmina's staff does a, a Zoom interactive where uh, they are doing some presentations, but they're also interacting. Um, and then of course there's an evaluation at the end. Typically people ask how much time is put into a training. And again, that varies. Um, it could be a two day training, which I think the number one challenge that we find is getting people to come to events these days. Everybody's so tech driven and on their phone or in the internet that um, doing it virtually um, is meeting the family where they are versus having them, even if, you know, especially in the underserved populations and rural areas where people have to drive five hours in Alaska to get to a training, it's just it's not um, doable. And then the average number, another question we get is how many people, what does a good training look like? And our um, Alliance members have told us that if they can get 10 to 12 people at a session, um, then, then they're good. And you know how often those sessions happen? Um, it depends on how large the staff is or how large the geographical area of that state is. Um, and then of course there's follow up to after the training to keep them engaged. Um, it, it's volunteer um, management more or less at that point in time, keeping them engaged and um, entering them into all of our databases and so forth. So that's a little bit about kind of what our support training looks like. Next slide. So this is what I call, or Lily and I call the magic in the match. And it can look very differently across diagnosis, um, demographics, cultures, et cetera. And, um, you know, I think that it's not just a diagnosis. I think it's important to let you all know as for spe specifically the clinicians in the room that uh, diagnosis could start in utero and you could call a, a, a fam or a parent to parent for family support at that point in time, even before the child has been born, because you may have access to what that um, genetic disorder or uh, might be. And you can access our support parents in utero. You could do it at diagnosis, preschool age. Um, there's, there's different touch points along our journey. Um, there, there comes a time when it's transition, which is what I'm going through right now with my older boys. And um, that it might be that I didn't need a peer or a support parent for five years and now I'm in, I'm in crisis again. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I don't know who to reach out to. This, these are the, um, the times that you could make that referral. And I just wanted to make sure that you understood it didn't have to be just at diagnosis, but it can be through the lifespan. Um, some of the matches are made in different criteria. Some, um, some are as, as broad as just similarities or a sense of sameness, meaning that that person's style and their, their uh, personality you might think would be a good match with a support parent. Um, and when we're looking for those support parents, we want to make sure that they're uh, flexible and that the support flows both ways, that it's not just about the support parent and their story and their experience, but that they're listening to what the family might need. And the matches can be made on many different factors. Um, some of our member alliance, alliance members um, go specifically off diagnosis, um, but it could be the age of the child, the language spoke, the geographical area, um, cultural ethnicity. It could be any of those factors that go into matching the the parent, if the support parent. Next slide. So this is this is um, one of the greatest values we have at Parent to Parent USA. Is like Carmina talked about. We have um, listserv platforms that we can communicate, but we have one specific to matching. 
So any of our 38 Alliance members can get on to a listserv and say in a, in a private HIPAA friendly way, I have a parent in Tennessee who has a two-year-old with CDL, you know, some rare genetic disorder or, or just autism, not just autism because that's my, my child's disability. Um, but they can, um, find somebody in their own community, which obviously is ideal to have somebody that lives by you that you can have a close relationship with and maybe perhaps see each other in person. But for somebody like Lily with a very rare genetic disorder, um, she could reach out to a national network of matching and say, I have a three-year-old with Cone syndrome. Is there somebody else in the country? And so that makes us unique. Um, it also makes us very um, resourceful and um, and all of our coordinators are on that matching list serve and can share that information, like I said, in a private manner. But um, I think it's really important for you to know to, when you're making referrals that you um, you can have access to a whole national network of, of support parents. Next. So this is what Carmina was talking about. Um, is best practices of, of you know once you, once you've made that match, what happens? And um, some of this you know was before COVID and before people could get you know in touch with each other more readily. But it kind of walks you just through the timeline of what it's a it's a standard um, guideline for us that we you know our member alliances we hope that they're following it. Um, sometimes it's not quite spot on, but it gives them um, and something that that we can give as a standard operating procedures for them to follow. So the contact, um, the match is made and the support parent is to contact the referred parent within 24 to 48 hours. Um, once that connection is made, they wanna follow up with that person within one meet, week. Um, and then to make sure that there's a total of four contacts within the first eight weeks. And then at the eight week mark, we wanna do what is an evaluation or um, feedback of, of how that relationship is going. Now, um, moving forward, we, we'd hope that there'd be, you know, checks along the way, one month, six months, you know, 12 months, so on and so forth um, to, to keep that parent engaged. But, it's, you know, parents become busy and detached and and move on but i think for most of our families they'll always remember that first support parent and they'll always go back to that person for um, ongoing help so this is just being very um rigid with following this in the beginning i think helps the success of the relationship between the support parent and the referred parent so next So these next two slides are, um, so every year we do an annual survey and ask information from our Alliance members that helps drive data so that we can give it to our funders. But, but this one was um, not necessarily for funders. It was to let our member, our Alliance members um, know kind of what's going on across the country. It's a temperature check. And I think you'll see um, in 2000, we haven't done 2019 yet. But across the country in 2018, there were 980 support parents trained. So that's a non-duplicated number. Um, there were 8,850 matches made, one-to-one -one matches, which is pretty incredible. 50% um, of, of the matches followed within the best practices of the first 48 hours. And then an average of 3.4 3 contacts between matches in the first eight weeks. So next one, Natasha. This gives you a general outline and um, this along with um, the roadmap that was shown earlier are all on our website, but we will be able to share these with you as well in, in the attachments. <clears throat> so we have 36 Alliance members and two community members. So we're in 38 states. We speak uh, nine language, or excuse me, 19 languages from our P2P staff, which I think is pretty incredible. <clears throat> and then we, uh, oh, the demographics of our staff, 96% of staff are parents of children with disabilities. Sorry, my throat's getting dry. 
Okay, so next slide, please, Natasha. And so um, our P2P staff across the country are also in it together. As we said, we support together um, nationwide. Um, Parent to Parent USA hosts a biannual leadership institute in different cities and states um, and where we gather and just communicate, build leadership skills, share our successes. We just really learn from each other and we build um, our camaraderie with our peers that, um, that we meet. And it's just, it, it really energizes everybody um, once we leave. Um, unfortunately, it's every two years, but it's definitely well worth it. Okay. Next slide, Natasha. So now I just kind of wanted to run through a couple testimonials. I mean, this is the heart of who we are. Um, this is a family in Tennessee who had 25 week twins um, who spent a lot of time in the NICU. Um, our parent, <clears throat> our parent to parent in Tennessee has staff that are in the NICU making um, referrals to directly to parent to parent. So I think that's pretty unique. <clears throat> Next one. Oh, this is a mom. The cutest little name. Isn't Stuart a cute name? So um, she said that P2P connected me with a valuable resource who provided relatable advice and uplifting support while my baby was in the NICU. This is another family from Tennessee who offered up their, their personal story of parent to parent. And the next one, Natasha. I liked, I liked this one. This is from a um, family here in Washington. And she said, parent to parent introduced my husband and I to our first Down syndrome family family. And the next one. <clears throat> this is another Down syndrome family from Washington. <clears throat> it has been the connection to amazing and cherished friends. It means everything. You make me cry. <laughs> So takeaways from today's um, webinar, uh, what we can do for you and what you can do for us is, is, is collaboration, um, the Family Center projects coming to an end. But that doesn't mean that we can't help you disseminate materials. Obviously connect parents to receive genetic services for input. Um, we can do that through our listservs. <clears throat> and then we can share our resources to you to give to your parents to make a referral to Parent Parent USA. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Next slide. Great. Thank you so much for that. That was really informative. I'm actually going to leave it on this slide in case people want to jot down how to connect with uh, you all directly. Uh, I know some of the questions or items that have been asked in the chat have been addressed, uh, but one item that um, I thought of as we are looking through this is, you know, you have such a long history and have clearly been through so much. Uh, I don't know if anyone wanted to speak a bit to what has changed over the many years. What are things that still remain the same? Sometimes it can feel like we're not making progress, but uh, you know, I wanted to hear from you kind of what that long history has been like and what um, just what that's brought you all. Carmina, can you can you add to that since you've been with Parent to Parent, I've, Lily and I have been with Parent to Parent for just over a year. Yes, yes, it has. Um, well, I think you can definitely look at the, the times we are in right now. So way back when it was one-on-one, -on -one, and I can talk about our trainings here in Connecticut, we would do them a few times a year. We would do them two nights. Um, and it'd be like a four or five hours a night. And as time went on, families get busier. So you have to constantly keep adjusting. So I think every parent to parent program is adjusting so, so they can continuously train families in the best way that they can. So now with this whole 
situation that we're in now, we've adjusted it again. You know, so now no longer is it in person, which is always a nice benefit to have because you really get to meet and um, you meet the families and you really get to know them. So when you're making your matches, you know off the top of your head, you know, who would be great and so forth. But now we've moved to a Zoom platform, which is still good, you know, um, and we've had to condense it because no longer it was harder for families to go out two nights. So now we did a one night, um, three, four, five hours, it depends. And now we'll do, if we can't get 10 people to come, we'll do two. So you really kind of work around the families because you don't, you don't want to not train them because they're great families and they don't have the time. You, you just try to adjust things as they go. Um, so again, I mean, as times go, I think every state just adjusts is the best way that they can. And I can speak on, again, on Connecticut. I mean, we've just changed it so much um, as the years go on and I see it changing more. Um, people have gone from face to face to just doing, you know, video you know, where they do the modules themselves and they do an interview at the end. So it's really, it's really has come a long way. Um, funding is still, a, you know, a struggle. You know, that's always been a struggle, even though we've been around, I mean, as I said earlier, 1960, but we're still struggling with the funding. Um, but emotional support is really important. And it's really the, the baseline for every family to have a great life with their child. If you can support them at the bottom, at the base, at the start, they'll just be able to, to grow and have a great life in the long run. And it's just trying to get funders to understand that, you know, mental health, emotional, it all comes with it when you have a child with special needs. Great. Um, one thing to kind of add on to that or um, that leads from that is you spoke quite a bit about having you know, evidence-based approaches. And um, even if at the beginning it wasn't a very, let's say, rigid evaluation, you're really tracking what you're doing, what's working, and how to build from that. Can you speak a little bit about um, either those efforts in the past or what that looks like today? So, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, we did some, um, at our Leadership Institute last year, we had you know, a candid time with many of our directors and coordinators to ask, we did a round table <clears throat> about that, what's working and what's not working. And we took back some of that information from that and put together a strategic plan that included a lot of things. And one of, you know, obviously one of the topics is online training um, and having something accessible at a national level that they can utilize. So that's one of our goals. Um, <clears throat> Funding, which is always a challenge, and I'm sure in these days with COVID-19, it's going to be a really interesting budget year for everybody, and we're actually hosting a webinar with three of our directors this summer on budgeting, so um, to provide to our members. Um, so, and we, we want to be transparent at the national level, so we're all, always um, opening the door for conversations if people want to to talk to Lily, Lily or I or, or the board on topics. Um, we wanna honor their, their membership dues and make sure that we're giving them value to having a national presence um, and providing them with, with technical assistance where we can. And a lot of that technical assistance comes from what I call peer-to-peer -peer support on the professional level. <clears throat> so our staff are helping other staff across the country in their grassroots efforts to save on money. Um, does that kind of, I hope that answers your question. Lily, did you have anything to add to that? I think, yeah. No, so that, that works. That's okay. Well, I, I see Robin on here. I didn't know if she wanted to add something, being that she's Miss Data and any. Oh, any um, that. On what? Well, what would you like me to talk about? I, I have lots that I could, but um, <laughs> um, I think that 
it's important as we move forward, and I've said this a lot of times, is to begin to refresh our um, evidence base um, which we started off kicking that off at the um, 2019 Leadership Institute by talking about, you know, getting back to um, getting back to evidence-based and best practices. And I think that that's an important start. But um, the what we need to do, and of course, this is always everything's always tied into funding, is to figure out how we can. Um, reassess our um, evidence to become more in the forefront. Um, some recent research that I've been doing with some parents who, um, who have accessed parent to parent while their child was in early intervention um, almost unanimously said, nobody knows who parent to parent is. I'd never heard of it until I was referred people need to know that you're there. How do you, so how do we build that public um, presence? And so part one piece is renewing our evidence base since our evidence based practices come from late nineties research. We need to figure out how we can work as a, a, a whole organization to reestablish those um, and get them back into the front of people's minds, but also thinking about um, how do we market that? How do we spread the word? How do we get ourselves um, to be visible in um, in a floodgate of di disability specific organizations? How does a disability inclusive and health care need inclusive organization get to the front of the pack? And so I think those are things that um, we're obviously all thinking about how we can um, make sure that, and because they all go together, the funding comes because we serve a certain number of people. We serve a certain number of people because we have the funding. People are drawn to fund an organization that has research behind it, you know, so it's all kind of works together and kind of just figuring out as an organization, how can we um, make these things speak to each other and build on each other in a spiral so that we can um, improve our prominence, but also to reach more families, which is ideally what we're looking to do. I don't know if I gave any solutions, but. <laughs> I think sometimes it's helpful to have everyone know that we are in maybe not the same boat, but very similar boats in terms of, you know, really wanting to understand uh, how you, you can know you're doing really good work, but how does that translate into tangible data that then you can use in multiple ways um, for multiple audiences, including funders, of course. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that is something that it's really important to know that many people are looking at that and especially in an age of, um, where you're hearing terms like patient-centered and family-centered um, a bit as a buzz, that there are some organizations who've been around and have been doing that for a really long time. It's just getting the data to be able to reflect the story that's, uh, that has been there. That's true. And, and, you know, there is even some recent research talking about how parent-to-parent -parent, um, is um, really augments that family-centered care and facilitates that being um, utilized and you know making it really work because um, so often our parent-to-parent -parent programs we're not only providing information and support to the to the parents we serve we're providing information and support to providers um, so that you know we really can facilitate that family-centered uh, model um, just by our our presence, but but we have to be we have to be known and we have to be affiliated in order to make that happen. Um, you know, of course, my dream is that we're in every NICU and every children's hospital in the world. Um, but how do we make those partnerships happen? And um, you know, how do we? Um, how do we do that in a way that stays close to our model and our values? 
A question that has come in is how do you parent, uh, how does parent to parent measure uh, parent and family engagement? I think that's a really good question because uh, how do you grade a person who, uh, like, how much better are you feeling since you've connected with a support parent, right? How do you quantify that? Um, Robin, do you have any addition to that? I know that you had some, had done sure. that once in the past. I have, but you know, I mean, the, I think that there are measures of, um, there's me measures of adaptation to the child's disability that can be useful. There's measures of um, emp parent empowerment that can be useful. I think, um, I think that as part of the data committee, which I'm still waiting um, for an invitation to get started on, I think that it would be helpful that um, if we were to decide on either a standardized measure or a couple of standardized measures or some items from different measures put together to that was more standardized so that we could measure that across organizations and, uh, and um, aggregate that data um, in order to be able to say something really specific about how parent care helps without obviously overwhelming our members. We know that we're dealing with families who are the busiest families you know, um, but if we could find a measure that, that, was, um, that could capture um, that, that would, be really, um, that would be really useful to have as part of everyone's data collection. Um, Again, I know we're all working with different um, data collection systems, um, and so that makes it hard how to add, you know, to add one more form or to change out one form is easy for some and a headache for others. But I think it could be really beneficial at least to pilot it in a few um, statewide programs and see if we had, um, if it was a, a measure that really could um, show the impact of even those first couple months of support. Um, and then we haven't really studied further out from those first couple of months of support. Um, and so looking at um, the impacts of parent to parent over time, because those first two months can move you from maybe that first, um, you know, those first uh, grief-like or high post-traumatic stress-like symptoms at the beginning into the, the searching phase possibly. But how, how does long-term interaction with parent-to-parent -parent impact um, a parent's adaptation, efficacy, leadership ability, and all of those things? Because in my understanding and from having known so many great women, um, mostly women in parent to parent. Um, I've seen that there is a trajectory that often starts in that really dark and challenging place, but moves on into leadership and um, just a personal philosophy of giving back to families. Um, and I wanna see how that, how that progresses over time. Um, so uh, possibly um, administering the same um, measure over over different uh, time periods would be helpful too to show that it's not just getting someone through those really really tough times but how does that relationship develop and how does the person change um, through their interaction with a uh, peer support and then also how does that change once you become the person who's providing the peer support because we know that that provides uh, value to people as well. Yeah, I think those are great comments and something that we have thought a lot about. Um, in particular, you know, uh, to add on to the kind of those questions you may want to, to think about is where does that um, leadership and advocacy and peer support skills go um, afterwards. And what I mean by that is, you know, as people have their children 
grow up, maybe transition. You may see, um, we see this a lot in when we're looking at our pediatric populations, you know, once they age, I don't want to say age out, but they're older, you may see that those skills are then brought to another part of the healthcare system that we may not directly see because we don't have programming there, but we know that those parents then bring those uh, skills and um, that ability to support um, other families into other arenas, whether they go more into the education side, let's say, or something else. So I think that's another piece too, that it isn't just, um, a benefit or a fuel to a very small circle, but it goes even beyond that. Um, you know, you don't lose those skills. You don't, you know, hang them up ever. Uh, so I, I think that's another kind of interesting piece to, to add on to that. Um, I know we are coming close to the end of our hour, and uh, there were a couple of comments speaking about, you know, potential different partnerships and, you know, really having um, a trained a peer parents being able to, you know, work in a range of different settings, um, mentioning the NICU, um, that is a really interesting uh, project and approach. And I think uh, to me, very uh, exciting and beneficial to be able to have people who are there who understand the benefit of referral. I think that we know if you say, oh, do you think someone should be referred? People are like, oh, yes, of course. But um, when we actually look at the data, so few times do people actually get referred for this type of support um, and, and information. We know that there still is quite a gap there. Um, I didn't know if anyone, if I, any of you wanted to speak to the different types of either partnerships or um, or I don't want to say placements, but uh, places where parents are are um, able to be able to be that link and that uh, that connection, and or where you wish you could see that. Someone mentioned, you know, it'd be great to be able to reach out to PTAs and things like that. So just wanted to speak more to those partnerships and how do you really do that actual linking of where uh, where a parent who is in need and may not. Uh, realize that, oh, there's a place I can go to. Um, there, there's someone who really understands not even just the questions I have today, but the questions I will have tomorrow. Um, if you wanted to speak to some of the work you've done on those partnerships or, or special programs. I mean, I can definitely go ahead. I was going to ask you, Carmina, I mean, from a national standpoint, um, there's no national OSPI or Office of Special Instruction. You know, they're all based out of each state. So that's kind of hard for us to, um, American Academy of Pediatrics would be a great place. The ARC, obviously, because the ARC's in almost every state. But what, what does outreach um, look like for you, Carmina, in Connecticut? Well, here we pretty much try to target everything from special education, we'll go to schools, we have targeted PTAs and SEPTOs and SEPTOs. Um, we've gone to the NICUs. Um, we've had a discussion with the March of Dimes because they provide support while in the NICU. And when they leave the NICU, they literally told me that they won't do follow-up. That's where we come into play. You know, families, you're in the hospital and you've got doctors and nurses there to help you. And when you go home, you're alone. Um, that's where parent to parent can come into to play. So trying to really make these professionals and these places understand that, yes, you know, you're there and you're providing the support here, but when they go home and they're alone, that's where they need that support. Um, we've gone to, you know, the early intervention programs here in our state, the 211 info lines. Um, so you try to target everywhere and, you know, but again, like Robin was saying, funding always ties into it. There's only so much funding you have. There's only so many hours the staff works. And I'm adamant about not wanting the staff to work way too many hours because they're not going to be paid for it, unfortunately. Um, so it's, it's like a, it's, you know, it's a circle, a vicious circle sometimes, you know. And then when you do, do hear those parents that say, geez, I wish I had known about you. You know, I wish, you know, it would have been great. I personally, I think I was telling Marsha and Lily, or I forgot who I was telling, but 
when my son, he was born in the NICU for like, he was in the NICU for a week and the hospital just gave me a folder of information. Not till three years later when we moved did I find that folder and sure enough, there was our organization in there. If they had just said to us, listen, there's an organization here that I think would be great for you to contact. And if you want, we will you know, sign this release. We will make that initial call for you. That's another point to make. A lot of times families are so overwhelmed, they're not gonna make that initial call because they've got so many other things going on. Mm -hmm. So we ask a lot of our providers, if you can just have the family sign this release form, we will make that initial call. Once that started going into play, we've been, we were getting a lot more calls because families do, they are overwhelmed. And, and it's not, unfortunately, that's not at the top of their list at that moment. You know, trying to, like someone said, trying to put food on the table, trying to make him stop crying, trying, there's just so much. Um, so you wanna take the burden off of them. And that's how we kind of approach it when we, we are out there talking to them. But it's still difficult, you know, it, it really is. And people say that they do parent to parent, but yes, maybe you do matching, but it's not the evidence base. It's not all of that. It's not the protocols. I mean, it's, it's, they're different. So you try to sell them on that too. So it is difficult at times, but there's definitely, you know, there's just a lot of outreach that needs to be done. Yeah, I, I think that's such an important point. A lot of outreach that needs to be done and then finding those champions who really get it and say, oh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, those who, people who go beyond the, yeah, that's a great idea. And, kind of, you know, yeah. and then not quiet, quietly or don't say out loud, hope that works out. But someone's like, that's a great idea. And what can I do to make that happen? What's the connection I can do to make that um, work? Uh, so I think that is a very, uh, very important point. And um, especially about, you know, what happens in a NICU and, uh, you know, just because a brochure or something is there doesn't mean someone's going to actually find it or um and we know this in our own lives like sometimes you have to just have that one-on-one -on -one with someone and say no this really is important um, i really think this can help um, just so that someone can then hear it without hearing all of the other noise and everything else that's that's going on um, we are at the hour, so I want to say thank you to everyone who participated and sent in uh, questions and comments, and a special thank you to our presenters from Parent to Parent USA. It was really a great opportunity to be able to share, uh, I feel kind of just the tip of the iceberg of what you provide in the wealth of experience and perspective that you bring to this space. Uh, as I said earlier at the beginning, we will be, this webinar is recorded and we will be sharing that as well as slides and resources with those who signed up. So with that, thank you everyone. Have a great rest of the afternoon and a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Bye. Bye.